and welcome to Inside Healthcare. We take a close look today at epilepsy. It's something that even legendary musician Prince said he had as a child. And did you know that civil rights activist Harriet Tubman, whose face you'll soon be seeing on the $20 bill, suffered from epilepsy her entire life? Doctors today now know a lot more about epilepsy and how to treat it than when Harriet Tubman lived in the 1800s, and even more than 50 years ago when doctors diagnosed Prince with it in the late 50s and early 60s. Today, doctors see more than 180,000 new cases of epilepsy each year in the United States, and about 30% occur in children. In fact, children and the elderly are the most affected. Dr. Tassiano Friday with Neuron Neurological Clinic is back joining us to tell us all about epilepsy. Why don't we start, first of all, I think there's um, people don't really totally understand what is ep epilepsy and what does happen when someone has epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I think it's Glad a really important back. topic to discuss because there are up to a few million people in the United States with epilepsy or seizures. And um, around the world, at least over 65 million people. So that's a significant wow. amount. And so education and recognition of symptoms are very important. So um, seizures are abnormal electrical activity in the brain. And how we defined a seizure versus epilepsy has to do with the number. So epilepsy is defined as two or more unprovoked seizures, I meaning... Think that might surprise people. Yeah, uh, yep. And it has to do with um, unprovoked seizures, meaning there was no alcohol withdrawal, there was no use of certain drugs such as cocaine, an underlying infection, or a certain cause that could have provoked the seizure. And um, so that's, that's how you would define a seizure versus epilepsy. So what actually happens mm -hmm. in the brain when someone's having a, a seizure, mm -hmm. an epileptic seizure? Yeah, so how a seizure presents is very different from one person to the next and really largely depends upon how much of the brain's involved. So a seizure is electrical activity. Mm -hmm. um, seizures, I, I think it's really easy to understand when you think about it in a prodrome, a um, an aura phase, an ictal, which is a seizure phase, and a post-ictal or post-seizure phase. So I'd like to just talk a little bit about how a seizure might present. Okay, uh, yeah, so what does it look like when that. someone's having a seizure? Sure. Yeah. So a prodrome phase is an abnormal feeling that, that people have um, inside, something bad's going to happen. Sometimes it's a day before, it can be hours before, but they just have this internal sense that something's not right. And then people can develop what's called an aura, and an aura can be a sensory feeling, it can be um, certain uh, so senses or feelings. So for example, they may have an intense fear out of nowhere, uh, unexplained, maybe a sense of deja vu, like they've been there before. Um, perhaps it's nausea or this epigastric, this rising sensation, uh, fast heart rate. Um, they might have what we call olfactory, which is a smell, or gustatory, which is taste hallucination. So they might be having metallic taste out of the really? balloon, or smell burnt rubber, or something rotten, but nobody else in the room can sense that. And sometimes it stops after this, this aura, this sensory. Um, but it can progress into the ictal or seizure phase. And if the electrical activity is very small area, it's a focal seizure, okay? And some of the brain is still functioning quite normally, so it can be a little bit more difficult to identify. But what may happen are people may, people may observe the individual staring off blankly. There will be a change in behavior, maybe a slowness to respond or a change in speech. Perhaps maybe their arm is having repetitive jerking movements or they're doing repetitive, we call those automatisms or repetitive movements like lip smacking, constant fumbling of the hands, pulling at the shirt. So there's a change in behavior. Now it's electrical, so sometimes it stays focal, but it has the ability to spread and involve the entire brain. And if that happens, that becomes a generalized seizure, a grand mal seizure, in which the entire brain is full of electrical activity. And by definition, then one has lost consciousness and is completely unaware. And the individual uh, may be seen having tightening, tonic posturing, followed by repetitive, aggressive jerking movements. Uh, because they lose consciousness, it's not uncommon to see cheek bites, tongue bites. You can have incontinence or um, wetting of the pants. And 
the post-seizure or post-ictal stage then for either one of those is a kind of like a stunned brain, an area that, or the brain is not working properly. Um, so they may act somewhat erratic, be confused, not answer questions appropriately. Mm -hmm. And this can vary, it may be 10 minutes, it can be several hours, and the older we get, sometimes it's a slower response to return back to baseline, but the brain is essentially stunned. So as you can see, it's, it's quite, there's quite a variety, but the key is a change in behavior. And unique to every individual is their presentation of the seizure, but it's stereotyped, meaning although your seizure could be different from my seizure, for example, it will present in the same fashion with every seizure. So I have something to, to identify and, and uh, let me know that the seizures to come. It's stereotyped or the same. You had mentioned briefly a couple of things that may be triggers perhaps. What are some of the causes that you see mm -hmm. for having an epileptic seizure? Mm -hmm. I think that largely depends upon the age. Um, you had mentioned that it's higher prevalence in the very young and the older population. So if, you, if we just break it down perhaps by mm -hmm. age in the uh, infants or the newborns in the young age, it can be some trauma during birth. So maybe they're premature and they have blood in the brain and that acts as an irritant and so that can cause seizures. Perhaps they were born with a slight variation in their brain or their cortex and that can be a seizure generator. Uh, perhaps it's just um, f familial or, or it's a genetic type of epilepsy. So there is a component mm -hmm. to that as there, well. There are some types. And then as we move on and, and we age a little, um, there can be traumatic brain injuries, sports injuries, Which infection. we've seen, mm -hmm. yeah. Infections can, can uh, occur with any age, of course. And as we then go into the um, elderly or middle age, new onset seizure, you have to think about other things occurring, stroke, tumors, anything structural that may be the ca you know, causing the new onset of seizures. So how do you go about diagnosing someone with epilepsy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are several steps to this. First is talking to the patient, getting a very good history to try to identify, is this potentially a seizure? And it's hard sometimes for people to articulate symptoms, but trying to put that together for them so you can offer some help and work up. And is it usually loved ones that are, can explain it more, or is it sometimes the patient? Just depends, really. I think it depends, and I actually... of treatments that we can do, ketogenic diet, which is a high fat, low carbohydrate diet, which can be useful for some. And why is that? I mean, do we know why that works? You know, it's more for types of uh, particular epilepsies, and we tend to do that in the younger population. So we don't always do that so much in the adult population. It's very hard to follow, um, but it has to do with, there's a different chemical and electrical activity going on with the brain, and we're trying to alter some of this with the things that we do. And what would that diet consist of? So it's a very, it's the nutrition and the physician would work very closely to do that, but it's a very, it's, it's a very high, high fat, low carbohydrate diet. Okay. And very, it requires a very rigid diet, so not always the easiest thing to keep within children or as we move forward. Um, 
There are things which I won't go in great deal about, but there's a lot of um, information out there about medical marijuana, and we're doing research on that and trying to find ways of, of using this perhaps to treat medical conditions and epilepsy. Yeah, and for that them. particular yep. treatment. Yep. And if a person has tried and failed two or more seizure medications, they are then classified as intractable or refractory epilepsy, which means that they have other, um, there are other options available to them. As part of this evaluation, there are some that are surgical candidates, meaning there may be an area in the brain that they could be surgically resected and therefore provide great seizure control. And so if they're a candidate, they would be referred to a surgical center with proper evaluation to see if it's in an area that could be removed and could then for help their wow. seizure. Uh, if they're not a surgical candidate, or sometimes we use it with a surgical candidate, um, other types of um, devices such as the vagus nerve stimulator and the RNS um, responsive and what are those? nerve stimulator. Mm -hmm. So the uh, VNS, or the vagus nerve stimulator, I have a picture down here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to, I think this nicely demonstrates, it's not a brain surgery, that's one thing that I hear frequently, and it's certainly not. Uh, this is an actual device, as you can see, it's not large at all, it looks like a little pacemaker, and it's placed under the chest wall. Similar, like a place, pacemaker. Mm -hmm. And there's a lead that goes from the device up into the vagus nerve, which is the highway to the brain. And it therefore provides, we program this device with the wand, and it provides electrical impulses very regularly throughout the day, a certain amount on, a certain amount off. So it's always working in the background to try to prevent those seizures from occurring. And there's also a magnet that comes with it. And the magnet looks like a watch. And an individual, remember I talked about those auras or those funny feelings that they might get, that rising sensations, those funny smells and taste, the deja vu, whatever their particular aura or warning is, that will give them a clue that, ooh, I think my seizure is going to come. They can take their magnet, activate their device, and it will wow. provide an additional, stronger electrical stimulation in hopes of preventing the seizure or making the seizure less severe, you know, um, so it stops at a shorter amount of time. So this is one type of, of device and, and being able to recognize if a person is a good candidate for this uh, and again, fail two, um, at least two seizure medications. And the other is the RNS, which is a, a device that is put under the scalp within within the uh, skull, and it has two leads or a couple leads from this, um, and it, it precisely is put in areas where the seizure focuses in the brain, and it monitors patterns. And as the um, brain starts identifying that, se or as this device identifies that abnormal pattern that is that's very specific to that individual, it will give a stimulation to stop the seizure. So it's a very precise treatment that is now FDA approved and available and good if someone has seizures coming, for example, from more than one site, so they would not be a surgical candidate. So as you can see, it's really the field of epilepsy has changed drastically and there are so many different treatment options. And so getting uh, appropriate evaluation and talking to provider about this for overall safety and um, treatment options is really critical. I mean, it sounds like you, it's more, you can live with it and, and have good quality of life Absolutely. with these treatments and that. The nowadays with all the treatments we have, people have um, normal, qual I mean, very good quality of life, and that is something that we really strive for. Some of the medications certainly can have side effects, but it's the individual and the provider need to work together so that the quality of life is good. And um, sometimes they require more than one medication, different treatment combinations, where this is really unique to the individual, and the, the epilepsy specialist or the physician, the neurologist can certainly help guide that. There's also some really important things that I want to mention that not everybody's aware of. Mm -hmm. But by Minnesota law, a person cannot drive within three months of a spell of loss of consciousness or seizure. And that sometimes very, is very hard for individuals because they feel like they've lost that independence. It makes it a little bit more difficult right. to, to travel to and from work. Um, but very, very important because if a person, the, the, the risk of having a recurrent seizure is higher in that time frame and that's where we've established that three month range. And as you can imagine, if someone has an alteration in behavior and their brain is seizing, if they're driving, that can end up in a very 
unfortunate uh, ending there. Well, why the three months? And why not six months or a it, year or, or a month or something? Yeah, it used why to be then? six months, and it has now been changed to three based on data that we've accumulated with the highest risk of recurrence. And is that the same for other states as well across the country? It varies slightly uh, from state to state, um, but I would say probably a great majority now are three months. It used to be six months. So what's the, the main message that you want to give to our viewers about epilepsy and that they should know about it? I, it's very important to talk to your provider, to seek help if there are certain changes in behavior, uh, concerns you have about spells, you don't know what they are, talk to us. We can help you. You can live a very normal life. You can be safe. And that's an important thing so that you have a good quality of life. There are many treatment options of it, as I've talked about. Um, so it's it's just being aware of it, educating people, and and not being ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. it it's it's I think nowadays we shouldn't be ashamed of it. It's it's a condition that's very treatable, and um, some women worry about can I have children? Can I not have children? Yes, absolutely, you can have children. You just need to be in the hands of a provider that can treat you. So when someone is having um, in labor, uh, can those sort of stressful things trigger activity like yeah. that in the brain? Yeah, the, the triggers are, is a really important question. So aside from non-compliance of, of meaning not taking your medication on a regular basis, other triggers would include sleep deprivation and stress. Interesting. As, mm -hmm. Aside from that, we always look for underlying infections or metabolic disturbances, so uh, sodium being off or your, your sugars or glucose being quite low, for example. So those can be triggers, and when someone goes to the hospital, the emergency department, those are things that will be checked for on a regular basis. The drug levels to make sure they're taking their medication, or perhaps medications might be interacting with the, medica with the seizure medications, causing them to be at lower levels. And um, so those are, those are important triggers hormonal influences, so <clears throat> changes that occur during pregnancy, changes that occur perhaps with just our menstrual cycles or with birth control, also very important things to consider when um, selecting medications and can be potential triggers for seizures. And I would say another reason not to binge drink or over consume alcohol, it sounds like as well, mm -hmm. that that can be a trigger. Alcohol absolutely can be a trigger, and in particular for certain types of epilepsy. Uh, drugs, stimulant drugs, diet aids, those can be triggers. There are also some prescribed medications, wow. which we know can be um, higher likelihood of triggering seizures, but the providers will certainly walk through that, review the medications, and advise. So if someone wants some more information about <coughs> epilepsy or about the mm -hmm. clinic and, or about um, where they can get some of this treatment and stuff, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, so if a starting point, you can always talk to your primary doctor who can direct you. <clears throat> Neurologists are certainly um, very comfortable with treating seizures. We have epilepsy specialists all around the, the Twin Cities area. We're very I'm fortunate. Certain, yeah. I'm very fortunate. And during clinic, we have several epilepsy specialists as well. Uh, the Epilepsy Foundation is a very good website, and I encourage people to use it. They provide a lot of good information about what seizures are, how to treat. Um, you know, resources available to people with epilepsy and families, support groups, lectures, and so Epilepsy Foundation is a very good starting point. Um, but most importantly, talk to your provider, ask questions, and don't be ashamed. Great advice, and always a pleasure to have you with Thank us. You. Thank you, Dr. Tassiano Friday. We Thank appreciate you. it. Appreciate it. Well, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, Urgency Room Doctor talks about the most common injuries at this time of the year that he sees, especially with children. So stay with us, everyone. Uh, I'm just gonna hang out. If any of your buddies ever pressure you to take a drink, just tell them you promised your dad you wouldn't. I promise. Love you too, Dad. They really do hear you. For tips on what to say, visit underagedrinking.samsa.gov. You might feel like there's too many problems in the world or that, you know, you as a 15-year-old, 16-year-old can't really make a difference. It's not always about you. It's not just one person. It's, it's a group. It's a team. Just that simple act is transforming someone else's life. It's one of the best feelings in the world. It'll just make you feel so good about yourself. I'd do anything to convince you just to be a part of this. 
Now we take a closer look at injuries most common to our children during this time of the spring and some tips on ways to protect them. Someone who knows all too well is Dr. Michael Bryant with the, the urgency room. The things that you see in the urgency room, especially at this time of the year, are just amazing. Yeah. So maybe we can start off with, uh, to me, I think springtime, I think the kids get out, they get on their bikes and things like that. What type of injuries um, do they see? You've got a helmet here yeah. to talk about one production and stuff. So what are some of the things that you see in the urgency room? So we room? kind of have five or six big types of injuries, but most of them are related to falls, falls from something. So we can talk about playgrounds, bicycles, skateboards. Um, my kids right now are lobbying for a trampoline. Uh, we see <laughs> my a lot kids of did too. I was so glad they finally got over that phase and we never got a trampoline. And sure enough, one of our friends had a broken leg and someone else had a sprain and it's like yeah. just dangerous. Yeah, and we've, we're Minnesotans. We've kind of been cooked up all winter and now we've got good weather. We're excited to get out there and start enjoying it. Um, injuries uh, are really common. Uh, specific, specifically like bicycle or skateboard injuries, about 90,000 plus injuries come to the emergency Incredible. department or urgent cares or places like the urgency room. Um, our primary focus for bicycle accidents is really preventing head injuries um, and helmets are the key. Um, it's really nice that we've kind of gone through a transition from when we were children where no one wore a helmet mm -hmm. and when you wore a helmet it was because you might have had some sort of medical disorder to now where it's it's pretty commonplace and and most of the time in our neighborhoods uh, where, where I live, the kids are wearing a helmet and it's no longer uncool. And I know. I, it seemed like my son, was he'd wear it when he was younger, but then trying to get him to wear it when he was older, it was like it was difficult. Yeah, I mean, and they, they can save your life. I, I'm also an avid cyclist and um, unfortunately had a crash and my helmet cracked, but my wow. skull didn't. And I think without that, I might not be caring for patients or being the father or husband I would like to be. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's important that not only have a helmet, but a properly fitting hel helmet, right? That's right. You want it to make sure that it's not tilted too far forward or too far back. You want it to cover the important parts. And one thing that people don't know is that once you've crashed in a helmet, you should get a new helmet. It's, it's sort of the warranty is over at that point. And because um, there'll be subtle cracks in the structure that might uh, not protect you from a, a subsequent fall. And what about skateboards? That's another um, skateboards. Lots of injuries. There is a lot, there are a lot of injuries, and uh, we see a good number of patients f uh, for that. Uh, the main thing again is helmets. Um, th there's cool helmets for skateboarding, <laughs> you know, are. and um, for for people who use ramps or uh, trick parks, they've even have cool versions of knee pads and elbow pads. It looks like uh, jeans or a sweatshirt, and they're sort of embedded within their clothing, and uh, they really do prevent a lot of well, the simple injuries, but also the more severe ones, you know, cups, cuts, scrapes, abrasions, things like that are going to prevent that pretty much universally. And then a lot of times prevent a fracture that would have happened. Well, what about like loose clothing too? I would think you have to be careful of that Absolutely. As well. You want to, you want to, I mean, that's why a lot of cyclists wear spandex because you're not catching things uh, on, especially like mountain biking, you're in the woods or in skateboarding on the ramp. Loose clothing is going to catch you and take your balance off and cause you to fall. And we're thinking about children riding their bikes. If they have a super baggy sweatshirt or something sticking off it, it's going to catch on their handlebars and they're learning. It's going to sort of up the ante on their degree of difficulty and they, they go down. Yeah, and playgrounds too. I mean, kids love playgrounds. And right, so I'm thinking about playgrounds and um, my brother just built one in his backyard and you talk about the different surfaces that children can fall on and concrete or asphalt kind of being the worst. And so if you're looking at doing sort of your spring project and you have a playground, consider putting down a couple, uh, couple inches of bark or mulch. The, it reduces the force from which someone would hit the ground exponentially compared to concrete and uh, turning a broken arm into a scrape. So that's really good. Yeah, I've noticed too, it seems like all the, the newer playgrounds too, that the padding, it's not just the metal now on the, on the slides and things like that. Yeah, so. absolutely. And then they're using uh, sort of recycled tires and things like that to really make a shock absorbent area. Uh, one thing that parents want to do is they want to enjoy the, the playground with their children, but if that's a recipe for disaster. If you put a 200 pound adult with a 20 pound child and you go down a slide and come to the bottom, it's not the 20 pound child's force going on their leg, it's your 200 pounds. And we do see, unfortunately, some injuries related to that. Yeah, I mean, our, we took our grandson, he's what, two, and, and we're right there, and he also kind of bumped his head a little bit, and thank goodness there's that padding, we were right there, and so. 
Yeah, so you said bumped ahead. ahead. So that comes up a lot in the spring. When do when do I need to take my child? That was my question. Shouldn't we go to the emergency room? And yeah, the emergency department or the urgency yeah. room where we see head injuries all the time. I was vetoed. I, they said, no, he's fine. He's, he's okay. And I go, are you sure? Yeah. And it's, it's really tricky to determine the difference between a head bump and a concussion. And really, it's um, you don't even have to hit your head. It's a deceleration of the brain inside the skull that has us worried about concussion. And it's a it's sort of that persistent headache. And it might not just be headache. It could be fatigue, confusion, nausea. And we move we move the continuum down to assume that everything's a head injury until we can sort of prove it's not. So, so it's always a good idea to bring them in. Yeah. So if, if your child has a head bump and they they jump back up and they're playing normally, fine. They're dazed. That's a different story. Uh, they they're not quite themselves. That's something we should talk about. And as hard as it may be, those are times where the best treatment actually is just sort of restrict your child's activity and give the brain time to recover. But these are things you want to talk to your doctor about, or doctors uh, like the emergency providers at the urgency room, where we can we can take a look at you or your child, look at the story, talk about the mechanism, how far did you fall, how they've been acting, and determine would you need imaging, would, meaning CAT scans or x-rays or things like this, or mm -hmm. can we just watch and treat and uh, manage conservatively? You know, the, everyone's bringing the lawnmowers out now, and I don't think we think of that usually in, in terms of injuries for children, but it, that can also pose a risk, people out with the lawnmowers. It, it, um, it is not taken as seriously as it, it should be. If you think about the physics of it, it's spinning a bl metal blade, spinning at hundreds of miles per hour. And so we think about, well, if I just stay clear of the mower blade, and thankfully the most majority of mowers being produced right now have an automatic stop. If we let go, the engine stops. I think there's some common sense things. Children under 12 shouldn't be operating a mower, no matter how bad mom or dad don't, don't want to mow the grass. Mm -hmm. There's some safety things. We, we recommend that you wear full-toed shoes, full covers, and I, I actually recommend socks up to the knees because uh, it's a projectile, it's like a slingshot. It picks up a rock or a piece of dirt or a fence. It, it's gonna hurt mm -hmm. when it hits somebody. Some people might think I'm going overboard, but I actually make my kids wear protective eyewear because I don't oh. know what's going to ricochet up. What about up. the ears, too? Yeah, for, for riding lawnmowers or things like that, there is that sound thing, and we, we have earmuffs uh, for when the kids uh, mow over at Grandpa's house on the, on the rider. But we had to make them wait till they were over 12 because we just it's like operating a car. You want to make sure they know what to do and that they're not going to panic. And there's just a lot of injuries that happen. Lost fingers, lost toes, and not lost, injured, cut off. And th those are things that are really hard as an emergency provider or even a surgeon to, to remedy. So all great advice, final advice for our viewers on keeping our kids safe, not only this spring, but this summer and going into the fall too. Well, be proactive. Talk to your kids about safety things, you know. Look both ways before you cross your street still works, you know. Um, set up some, some safety measures. Encourage your kids to wear helmets and do so by wearing a helmet when you ride your bike too. One thing that I wanted to touch on was pool safety. Uh, swimming is, we're just opening all our pools and mm -hmm. things like that, is that want to encourage people to get swimming lessons and to make it comfortable to have life vests around. If kids come to your house or you send your child to someone else's house, make it cool to wear a life vest if they're un uncertain. And as a homeowner, as a parent, you have to be an active participate in, pool, participate in pool parties. You have to watch. If you're not watching, no one's watching. So as people look forward to getting more active this spring, I just say uh, enjoy it. Um, if you do get injured, uh, you can come to the urgency room. We have full imaging capabilities as far as CAT scan, MRI, I'm sorry, CAT scan, ultrasound, fluoroscopy. We, we can take care of fractures from diagnosing them to setting them and giving good referrals. So uh, we like spring. It's good for business, but it's really good for our community to get out and be active. All right. Well, Dr. Michael Bryant, thank you for being with us with the Urgency Room. Always a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And we'd like to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you here next time on Inside Healthcare. See you then, everyone.